2 Kings 22. We're going to look at this little second piece of Josiah's story. Uh, last week we looked at the beginning of just who the person that Josiah was. We're going to do the same again. Um, I, I cut this off early because I really want us um, to focus in two weeks on the, reform, the repentance and reforms that Josiah leads the nation through. It really is an incredible thing that we'll read. But to give you a quick recap, Josiah becomes king at the ripe age of eight, right? And then at age 16, he dedicates himself to the Lord and to the Lord's con- instruction. And then at 20 years old, he begins to start these reforms the, the, um, on the community, seeing all the idolatry that spread. And then he starts cleaning up the temple. And as he cleans the temple, what's he find? But the Bible, <laughs> The, the, you know, the Old Testament scriptures, most likely at least Deuteronomy, maybe even the total of the first five books of the Old Testament, are found somehow lost in God's temple. They bring it to Josiah, and he be, they begin to read it to Josiah, and he is struck by what he reads. Blown away at just the sin that has just run rampant in their country, and he's so overwhelmed by it that he tears his clothes in mourning and in agony, and he tells them, go find a prophet to hear from the Lord what it, this means for us. And that's where we pick up the story. We're just going to look at verses 14 through 20. It says, so the priest Hilkiah, Ahikam, Akbor, Shaphan, and Isaiah went to the prophetess Holda, wife of Shalom, son of Tikva, son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. She lived in Jerusalem. By the way, I want someone to try to say that whole sentence at least five times as fast as they can. Not fun. Okay. She lived in Jerusalem in the second district. They spoke with her, and she said to them, This is what the Lord God of Israel says. Say to the man who sent you to me, this is what the Lord says, I am about to bring disaster on this place and on its inhabitants, fulfilling all the words of the book that the king of Judah has read, because they (coughs) have abandoned me and burned incense to other gods in order to anger me with all the work of their hands. My wrath will be kindled against this place and it will not be quenched. Say this to the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. As for the words that you heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse. And because you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I myself have heard. This is the Lord's declaration. Therefore, I will indeed gather you to your ancestors, and you will be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster that I am bringing on this place. Then they reported to the king. If you've been here as we've been walking through 2 Kings, you know that it is clear that judgment is coming on the nation of Judah. They have walked away from the Lord. And it seems like the last three kings right, have been told it's going to be bad. But what we see here is that, that through, the, um, through God's word to Hulda, that the, that the judgment is going to happen, but it's going to be delayed because of the heart of Josiah and because of his leadership. And as I just mentioned earlier, in the next passage that we'll look at, we see as he leads this nation through a time of repentance and restoration. It's a beautiful thing. But here's what I want to do very quickly tonight. I want to look at Hulda's word from the Lord and then look at the heart of Josiah. In many ways, ask this question about Hulda. And it's this, why her? Why was she the one that was chosen? If you didn't know, there's actually only four times in the Old Testament where we see a female prophetess who is the one speaking for the Lord. But at this time, you also had Jeremiah, Zephaniah, and Nahum. So why did, why did God choose to use Hulda? Well, to be honest, we don't really have a clear answer in the scriptures, but the ancient rabbis, they gave a couple of reasons why they think she might have been chosen. I want to offer you those three. I think I have them in your notes. First, they said that, they said that some um, said the delegation went to a woman because they believed that she would be more tenderhearted and rather than rebuking the people for their transgressions, would be inclined to pray for them. When I first read that, it's funny for me because in my family, it was actually the exact opposite. 
my mom was the hard-nosed rule keeper and my dad was the big softy. So for instance, if I wanted someone to spend the night at our house, I knew better than to go ask my mom if this person could spend the night. I went straight to dad. You know what my dad's answer always was? Sure, that's fine. Of course, he was going to work the next day and my mom was the one who was stuck at home with more boys in the house at that time. Or I also knew if we were ever going to the store, if I went with mom, I was getting nothing. But if I went with dad, I was coming home with either a toy or candy. I just knew it was going to happen. <laughs> I was going to get it. And obviously, if that was the reason, obviously it was wrong because then when they went to her, they got hit with a, thus says the Lord. <laughs> They got hit by the Lord's words right there, and it was clear she did not hold back. Now, others taught that maybe that was because Jeremiah had just begun his prophetic ministry and had not yet become widely recognized, while Huldah, on the other hand, already had a good reputation for the work that she was doing in Jerusalem. Obviously, she was around the temple because her husband was the keeper of the wardrobe, which then give is the third answer. Others, they, they explain that Hulda was the wife of one of the priests and therefore was well known for her gifts. We don't know, but I'm pretty sure it's probably something to do with either two or three. That's what makes the most sense in this situation, that God was using her to speak on his behalf. Um, and they knew that because of her husband. So th that's there. We, we've seen this message time and time again, that God is bringing judgment. But we see that he... He says this judgment is not going to come too quick, and there's a reason why. It's Josiah, specifically Josiah's heart. And that's what I want to look at. I think when we look at Josiah, we truly see a heart that God can use or the very heart of a person that God is looking for. Let me give you three things that we see about Josiah's heart. First of all, we see that he has a tender heart. God is looking for a tender heart. Verse 19, he says, when, when speaking for the Lord, she says, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse. And because you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I myself have heard. The passage tells us it was Josiah's tender heart and humility that caused God to hear his cries. Now, I find this interesting because we live in a culture that prides itself on being hard-hearted. This thought that nothing can shake me, nothing can break me. Maybe you've heard one of these two phrases, real men don't cry, heard that? Or there was another phrase that's been around, but a pop artist named Fergie made popular about uh, 15 years ago, and it's big girls don't cry. So real men don't cry and big girls don't cry. That's, that's what we pride ourselves on. Well, isn't it interesting then that what causes the Lord to respond to Josiah wasn't the strength of his resolve in that moment, but it was his tears and his humble mourning upon hearing the message of the Lord? That's, he says, the Lord says, because of that I have heard. Why is that so? It's because soft-heartedness is the good soil which bears good fruit in a person's life. If you want the Lord to work within you, your heart has to be tender. That soil needs to be soft. I've told you many times of my struggles of growing grass in my yard. And sometimes this kind of feels like a therapy session for me where I can kind of gripe and complain about why this isn't working. Time and time again, I've spent way too much money on different treatments for my yard to grow grass. There's areas that it's worked. But I have three areas in my backyard that just nothing. Every time, put grass seed down, put the fertilizer, water it, nothing sprouts up at all. What usually ends up happening is either the seed ends up just kind of running off or the seed ends up burning uh, in, exposure to, in exposure to the sun. After just being frustrated with that, uh, about a month ago, I started doing what any millennial does when they're trying to figure something out. I went to YouTube and watched a whole bunch of videos on the subject. So we become experts in everything because of YouTube today, right? So I, I start watching these videos on lawn care, and here's what I discovered. Grass was not growing in those places because the soil was so hard that nothing could penetrate it. 
So they said, here's what you need to do. You need to get you a metal rake or some kind of tiller of some kind and break up the soil. Do the best you can to break it up. And once it's broken up, it'll soften. Air will get in there. The water will get in there. It'll loosen up. Then as you lay seed down, that ground is going to be ready to receive the seed. But it's only going to happen when you break it up. The same thing is true for our hearts. If we're going to be ready to receive the word of the Lord, to receive what it is he's going to do, the first thing we've got to do is break it up, remove the hard-heartedness. You see, the Lord is looking for a tender heart, a heart that is ready to receive both his rebuke and his grace. James 1.21 says it this way, Humbly receive the implanted word. Humbly receive it, which is able to save your souls. Can I offer you one way that we can have a tender heart or we can keep a tender heart? We naturally all move towards hard-heartedness. That's just reality. So how do we keep a tender heart? This is hard, but it's good. It's by letting the Lord do daily examination of our hearts. Let the Lord do daily examination. Psalm 193 is one of my favorite passages, one of my favorite Psalms in the scriptures and it, Dave, uh, it's clear from the psalmist that, that the Lord knew us before the foundations of the world. He formed us. And upon knowing that, he offers us these words in verses 23 and 24. It says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. Now, that's a beautiful psalm to read, but that's a hard psalm to pray, isn't it? Do you know how hard it is to truly pray, search me and know my heart? Look for the bad. Lord, I'm open. Examine me. Examine everything. We typically want to hide that, don't we? It's a scary thing to be open and exposed to the Lord. Examine me. I, uh, another thing I've talked about in here is my love for lifting weights. I've done it since I was in seventh grade, and throughout my adult life, it's been something that I've just done on my own. But I noticed that as I was lifting weights on my own and getting older and dealing with the stress of kids and everything, it began to be easier and easier to make excuses why I didn't need to go and lift weights. Maybe you've been there before. Ah, oh, well, I'm tired, I need to get more sleep, or my back hurts a little bit, and so I just kind of began to drift away. Well, last year, I joined Sarah at a gym that she had been going to called Fit Club for a workout on a Friday morning. I try to be out of office on Friday, and I thought it'd be fun. I was like, you know, I won't you know, go in and just kill myself, I'll just take it easy. And I walk in, and I look at the board, and the workout that day was run two miles and do 100 burpees. If you don't know what a burpee is, it's where you jump down on the ground, do a push-up, jump back up, jump back up in the sky, and that's one. And you got to do a hundred of them. I was burping all right by the end of that. I promise you that. It was terrible. I'm asking myself, why in the world did I show up in this place, right? I went a couple more times with her in the fall, and uh, at the end of February, I decided to kind of end my membership at the gym I was going to and, and join Fit Club with, with Sarah. And I sat down one day with TJ, who's the owner. TJ grew up here. He's a believer, a great guy. And I just began to talk to him about where I was, where my life was, and what I was trying to kind of, what disciplines I was trying to get in my life right now. And he said, Justin, if you're going to do this, it's got to be more than just you exercising. He said, you've also got to get your food right because food is like 90% of it. You could run for three days straight, but if you ate enough calories that then overdid that three days of running, it doesn't matter at all. He said, here's what you're going to do, Justin. I want you to download this app, and on this app, you can track the food that you eat that day. Literally scan it in to this app. You're going to have goals for calories, for protein, for carbs, for fat. And I want you to do what you can to stay inside of that goal every single day and see what happens. Well, Sarah and I began to do it together, and it became effective. Um, Sarah and I began to be able to see what we plugged in every single day. Um, But can I tell you why it was truly effective? It's because not only could Sarah see it every single day, but TJ could also see what I was plugging into there every single day. And the last thing I wanted was to walk into the gym the next day and him be looking at me, be like, I saw that Papa John's pizza, you know? 
What was that? Or I noticed you didn't put anything in for dinner yesterday. What was that reason, right? Well, it's because I went to the Chinese restaurant. That's what, you know, you know I, look, there was, what was it? It was accountability because every day, really at least once a week, TJ was examining everything that I was eating. Now, for some of you, that sounds like literally your worst nightmare. But for me, I needed someone examining me. We talk about in the church all the time the importance of accountability, right? People that we can walk through and talk through things with. Why not it work for something like that? This idea of examination. Think about it then spiritually. How much more tender would your heart be toward the things of God if you allowed him full access to your heart? Full examination. Now, is that going to hurt sometimes? Absolutely it is. But, even, but when he shows you your sin and he reveals that, what always comes with it is his love and his grace that's going to be there to heal the wound of that sin. I ask you today, be willing to let the Lord till the soil of your heart, to break it up. And then not only that, if you're willing to go even a little further, allow someone else in your life to till the soil of your heart, to break it up, to make sure it stays tender. Now that's the longest one. Let me do the last, last two quickly. What else is the Lord looking for? He's also looking for a heart that is open to his word. Passage we looked at last week, it says, this is what, um, when Josiah heard the word read, he said, go and acquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all of Judah about the words in this book that has been found. What happens? He hears it and immediately Josiah seeks to know what these words mean for him and for the nation. He didn't put the book back up on the shelf. No, he understands the gravity of the words that he's reading and he wants the instruction. He wants to learn. He wants to grow. He wants things to be changed. I mean, do you have a teachable spirit like that? This desire and the same when you hear this, that you want to learn, you want to grow, you want to change? Sarah's uh, parents, they have a story they love to tell that her, one of her favorite things to say when she was little was, I mean, I almost know everything, is what she would tell people. Um, and one day, uh, her dad said, oh yeah, well then, what's the answer to this? And he said some really hard math problem, and she said, well, I know almost everything, but I don't know that, okay? Uh, I almost know everything. I, I ask you this, is that how you approach the scriptures, or is that how you approach the study of God's word? I read it once, I, I almost know everything. I've got it all figured out at this point. I don't need a Bible study leader or a preacher or anybody to tell me anything different. I think I know it. I've got a quote from Charles Spurgeon that stays in my office uh, that I can see from my desk every single day. He says, it says, nobody out, ever outgrows scripture. The book only widens and deepens with our years. That's how it works, friends. You see, if we're truly open to learning from God and his scriptures, then year after year of reading the Bible will not cause his truth to become stale in our lives, but actually more alive and more real as each year passes. If you're truly open to it, that's what it does. You see, and what you'll find is that without even forcing it, you'll find yourself walking closer to Jesus than you were before you ever started the journey. He's looking for a heart that is open. And then finally, he's looking for a heart to bless. At the end of the terrible news about what's going to happen to that nation, Holda ends this, speaking these words from God. Because his heart was open and tender, therefore I will indeed gather you to your ancestors and you will be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster that I'm bringing on this place. See, God honors Josiah at the end of this by granting him relief for the judgment in his lifetime. Because he was open, because his heart was tender, God blessed him. You see, God truly is looking, look, God truly looks with favor on those who honor and walk in his word, who choose to make it true for them. I can read to you Psalms 1, which is an incredible passage that you should read, but let me just read Psalm 119, verse 1. It says, how happy or how blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk according to the Lord's instruction. Who is the blessed one? Who is the happy one? The one who walks according to the Lord's instruction. 
You see, friends, when you read the scriptures, you find that there are rich spiritual blessings that are to be experienced when you walk in the word. If that's so, then what blessings then are we missing when we choose not to walk in the word? When we say we don't need it. We don't need the instruction anymore. What are we missing out on? Let me end with a story from Charles Spurgeon. He talks about visiting an elderly woman um, in the almshouse. If you don't know what that was, it was a home for the elderly who could not afford to live on their own at that point in their life. He was visiting her and he was drawn to the attention of a plaque that was on the wall. It was this framed document and he began to ask her about it. And she said that years before she had cared for this, this gentleman who was an older gentleman and before he had died, he had written out a little note of appreciation to her and he signed it. When Spurgeon was looking at it, he could tell that this was more than just a random note of appreciation. It was more than that. He was offering and giving something to her. So after he pressed her on it a little bit, uh, press, after he pressed her on it, she let him take that note with him and um, he took it to the bank. You see, not long after he had written that note, that old man had died. And when Spurgeon got to the, to the bank and he showed them that note, he, they said this, they cried out, we've been wondering to whom this old gentleman had left his, all his money to. For years, this man had left every bit of money he had to this older woman and she had no idea because it was framed in her house, in the almshouse. Think about this. She was an incredibly wealthy woman, but she had been living like a beggar for years, not knowing all the money that she had. Well, friends, when we choose not to walk in the word to experience what it is that he has for us, what we do is we end up living like spiritual beggars, not experiencing his blessings. So friends, let's not live like spiritual beggars. Let's choose to cultivate hearts that God can use. Tender ones, those who are open to his word, and those who are primed to be blessed by the Lord. Let's pray quickly. Father God, we love you. We thank you for the chance we get to study your word. God, break up the soil from our hearts and let us receive your instruction. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.